I wonder what it would have been like to stand on the plains of Shittim as one of God's people. Think with me for a moment about the young mom who perhaps rose early to feed a hungry baby. As she sits soothing her baby with the nourishment from her own body, looking out at the early morning sky begins to light the swollen river beyond. What were her thoughts? She spent her entire life wandering in the wilderness. She's never had a permanent home. She grew up hearing the stories of how her people's God, Yahweh by name, dried up the Red Sea as their leader Moses led them out of Egypt and away from slavery and bondage. She knows that Yahweh is capable of more than she can even imagine. She spent her whole life eating the food that he miraculously provided, provides each and every day. She's worn the clothes and the shoes handed down to her from her older siblings, clothes and shoes that never developed holes, never wore out. She smiles as the babe in her arms stirs, a babe wrapped in a blanket that her own mother wrapped her in. Yes, Yahweh is a good and capable God. The camp around her begins to stir with the waking of others. For two days, they have been uh, camped here on the plains of Shittim, looking out to the Jordan River. The air is thick with anticipation, excitement mingled with fear. Joshua, their new leader, has told them that Yahweh is about to lead them into the promised land, the land she has heard about her whole life, the land just across that river. Their new home, but other people live there now. Other people call that home. So how exactly are they going to get across this river? And once across, how are they going to make the Canaanites home, their home? She has so many questions. There's just so much unknown. If we're to arise and cross this Jordan without fear or trembling, then we must prepare ourselves. And this preparation must come before we're in the middle of the Jordan. So let's look again at God's words of preparation to Joshua. Read with me starting in verse 7 of chapter 1 of Joshua. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. In order to be prepared to cross the Jordan, we must first prepare our hearts. God says to him in this short passage, be careful to do according to all the law. Do not turn from it. Be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Those three phrases in verse 7 and verse 8. 
Because God's instructions to Joshua on how to prepare to cross the Jordan and how to get ready for the coming battles was to know him and know his law. Do you think that was the battle plan that Joshua was expecting? It's not the typical battle plan. And yet God knew this was exactly the words Joshua and I need to hear. Because there is security in understanding the promises and the character of God revealed to us within his instructions. We are meant to find him, the essence of him within these instructions. These aren't just a list of do's and don'ts. They are his heart. And once we realize that, then looking for and finding him within his laws should lead us to a peace that passes all understanding. This says to me that careful obedience is required. Be careful. And that the details are important. Be careful to do all that is written. Do according to all the law. Like Joshua, I am able to overcome the unknown trials to come because I have been diligent to first know and cling to God's holy words. When God's instructions and wisdom are planted firmly within my heart, the proper path forward will become much more clear. My priorities will be properly sorted, and the goal will be evident. When my heart is aligned with the Spirit of God, choices of right and wrong are just not that difficult to discern. But I first have to know him and his words. Not only did God instruct Joshua to know the laws? But he said to, and to follow all the laws. But God takes it a step further when he tells Joshua to meditate on it day and night, saying, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. I think of all the things that depart from my mouth in the course of a day. I think meditation is an unfamiliar concept in our modern society, a society that floods us with notifications, with text messages, with weather alerts, with news headlines, with emails and voicemails and all the other mails, constant. We choose to wear devices and sometimes several devices at the same time, which constantly interrupt our current chaos with other chaos. So much happening. But I think to meditate is a skill we all need to to develop. To meditate is to sit with, to dwell in, to focus on, to contemplate a particular mental, emotional, and or spiritual state. Simply put, meditate means to be quiet and mindfully concentrate without distraction. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to sit cross-legged, close your eyes, and offer a om. That's not meditate. It does mean that all of us could probably benefit from some more peaceful, thoughtful moments in our lives. And in today's day and age, you have to be be purposeful to create those moments. 
To meditate on God's law means that we must not only be reading God's words, but we must be letting them sit in our minds and in our hearts. Plowing through a read through the Bible in a year or other Bible reading schedules is noble. I'm doing one myself this year. And it's probably necessary. Lots of us like the accountability and the check marks. But we must also allow space in our minds for these words to, to echo, to take root in our hearts during the rest of our day. If you just read the words and went on without taking those words in, all you've done is checked off a box. That's not meditating. And it's impossible to meditate upon God's words, to let those words take root in our hearts if every moment of our day is filled with entertainment and distraction. The psalmist says, how blessed is the man. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. So there's lots of different ways you can accomplish this. But just to help us think, what does this look like? Here's a few examples of meditation I came up with. It's taking the time to memorize scripture. When was the last time you challenged yourself to implant God's words into your mind? We often put a great emphasis on this in our children's Bible class, which is good. But what about you? In the quiet of your everyday life, do you plant God's words so firmly in your heart and your mind that you don't need to look at them, to glean comfort from them? That's a form of meditating upon his words. Singing can be meditating, especially the songs that are God's literal words put to music. We have so many great hymns where talented people have taken the very words of God himself and set it to music. What if you let that resonate in your mind throughout the day? Or how about writing scriptures on post-it notes? If you know me, I'm a big lover of post-it notes. I almost put favorite office supply post-it notes. Weird, I know. But I do love a good post-it note. What about post-it notes with scriptures? Purposely picking out scriptures that you know could help you throughout the day. Placing those post-it notes in various places within your home, not where you'll just glance at it, read it, move on, but challenging yourself to dwell in a moment of meditation when that post-it note brings that scripture to mind. All of these require us to be purposefully and intentionally dedicated to God's words. It requires us to purposely turn off the music, turn off the podcast, turn off the tickety-talk, turn off the Netflix, and tune in to God. Tune in to creating moments within our day where we can dwell on particular passages, particular phrases or words of Scripture. The Apostle Paul's familiar words must not grow stale. Faith. How do we face that, Jordan? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Your battle plan is before you. If we want faith that gives us the strength and the courage, we must have ears attuned to hearing and hearts attuned to seeking to know his words. 
This is so basic. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. It's so simple. It's not complicated. Yet it is so neglected in my life, and I'm guessing maybe in your life too. But we, if we will consider the charge to Joshua that reading, knowing, and meditating on the law were what God commanded of him, recognize that this charge to Joshua to read, to know, to meditate on the law is the only action required of Joshua to prepare the strength and courage he would need. This is not a battle plan that we would expect. This is the battle plan. An oversimplified summary for God's battle plan is this. If I want strength and courage, I need to get into the word. That's how we do it. Our hearts will be prepared and our faith will be built by knowing God's laws and by realizing who he is, a capable and assured promise keeper. I have given it to you. The land which I am giving to them, verse 2. I have given it to you, verse 3. I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you, verse 5. For Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go, verse 10. He's repeating it a lot so that you'll get it. Strength and courage flow from the assurance that he is a promise keeper and that victory is certain. The outcome is already determined. There is no chance of defeat or of failure. No chance. God did not immediately demand great gestures of obedience or magnificent acts of sacrifice from Joshua. He simply called on Joshua to sit in the assurance of the predetermined outcome. Sometimes faithful obedience requires stillness. Another thing we're not very good at, are we? As God is finally telling Joshua how the people were to cross the swollen Jordan River in chapter 3, he says of the priest who would be going first, carrying the ark, that, verse 8, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. When we illustrate this for children's Bible classes, we often portray these priests as walking down this gently sloping river bank, kind of like how we walk from the beach into the warm, shallow waters of the Gulf of Mexico. That looks so pleasant. So easy to just dip your big toe in and come right back out. But this is not what the east side of the Jordan River is actually like. Turns out, this wasn't their reality at all. Rather, entering the Jordan River on the east bank would have required an immediate commitment because it was more like stepping off the side of a rocky embankment. When you're in, you are in. And the first, the first people called to enter the Jordan River were the priest. They were carrying the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. There would be a, four of them at least, one on each side, carrying the poles, the Ark of the Covenant. Can you imagine the faith those first two priests had to have had? That first step would have been a doozy. And they weren't just stepping into a calm wading pool. The muddy waters, remember, the flooded waters, they would have obscured the bottom 
of the, of the river, they would have been swirling, rushing currents that would have been whipping and pulling around their feet and legs. And those first two priests, they had to step in and then step further in and further in so that the priest behind them could also come into the water, all of them bearing the weight of the ark, stepping down and into the water. Because this was not like the Red Sea. At the Red Sea, God parted the waters before the people, and then the people walked through on the dry ground. Amazing enough, right? But God has a different plan with the Jordan River. Because it is clearly stated that only once the priests were in the water did God then do his work of stopping the flow. That said, God didn't command them to rush headlong into this obstacle. He didn't ask them to do things like build a bridge, build a boat. He didn't tell them to attack it, swan dive into it, thrash around in it, show your might and your strength and your worth. No. He commanded them to simply step into the water. And then did you catch it? Stand there. Letting that watery barrier flow over themselves until God completed his work of removing the obstacle and creating a perfect path. Remember, at this point, it is likely that this river is a mile long. Not only does God remove a mile's worth of water, he then turns that muddy riverbed into completely dry ground before their eyes. The power to overcome that river was clearly not their own. Their path to take hold of the promise would only come through complete reliance on the promiser. Like those first priests, I must see that my faithful obedience requires first my willingness to relinquish control. I'm not very good at that relinquish control and allow God to work where only he is able. There is certainly a time for drawing the sword and hacking down the enemies to the kingdom. That time would soon come for the Israelites. But more often, I just need to walk quietly with God and watch while he stops the river, while he brings down the walls. The psalmist says this, these beloved words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The people would literally walk in the lowest valley of all the promised land on their journey through the Jordan River. Can I walk into the valley fearing no evil, trusting that he is leading me? He is capable. Psalm 46.10 says, cease striving and know, know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Over and over in the book of Joshua, it is recorded that Yahweh fought for Israel. 
and that he gave them the land which had been promised. 1 verse 11, the land which the Lord your God is giving you. 6 2, I have given Jericho into your hand. 8 1, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. 10 8, I have given them into your hand. 1042, the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. 2144, the Lord gave all the enemies into their hand. And as Joshua sums it all up in his parting address to the people, he declares this, not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled to you. Not one of them has failed. If Yahweh is capable of parting the river, of knocking down walls, and soundly defeating enemy nations, what obstacle is he unable to help me overcome? He is capable. He's shown that already. Do not tremble or be dismayed because the victory is certain. The outcome is already determined. Therefore, I can have strong and courageous faith to face what seems like the impossible obstacle. Have I not commanded you? What a beautiful question from God to Joshua. Have I not commanded you? Because it says this, what more do you need? His command alone is evidence that it's possible. If he hasn't commanded it, it's not possible. It is possible because he has commanded it. His instruction is the assurance that it will be accomplished. And his encouragement is the only strength and courage that are required. And finally, we prepare our hearts to face Jordan by personalizing his instructions, his promises, and his blessings. He says to Joshua, you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. He also says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, verse five. You shall give this people possession of the land, verse six. And you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success in verse 8. Now, without question, the power and the victory is only from God. But do you catch what's happening here? Because he is eager to share the victory with his faithful servant. The assurance and the motivation to Joshua here is personal. These are not just general promises or a universal encouragement to the nation of Israel. This is Yahweh's promise to Joshua. Surely the entire nation and endless generations would benefit from Joshua's strong leadership and courageous faith. But Yahweh sought to also exalt Joshua personally. The difficulty of the challenge that you are facing is directly related to the degree to which God is willing to exalt you individually. I don't think we see our challenges that way. Meaning that whatever the challenge that he has allowed to be placed before you, whatever that challenge is, he knows that he can be exalted and exalt you through the overcoming of that challenge. 
If we learn anything from the success of Joshua and the failures of subsequent generations, it's that we must never be content to just settle for anything less than what God is willing to give. God had assured victory over the entire nation of Canaan, no matter how strong they were, no matter how big their, in, their armies were. God had assured victory with Joshua as the leader. And Joshua led the people to great victories, which did secure the promised land for the nation of Israel. And for this, Joshua was exalted and rewarded. But there was still work to be done. And sadly, the subsequent generations failed to finish the task because they allowed the enemies to remain among them. This became their downfall and their humiliation. Make no mistake about it. The will of God will be accomplished with or without you. But if I personalize his instructions and his promises, if I see myself as part of the story, he has assured me that he will work through me and exalt me in his victory. But from the outset, we must determine to complete God's purpose. We must not let the enemy remain with a foothold in our lives. Where does the enemy have his foot in your life? Because if the victory is certain, then you must not settle for anything less than victory. Victory equals knowing that our small lives play a big part in God's great plan. And as such, we must commit ourselves then to a life of faithful service in his kingdom no matter the raging Jordan that we might be facing. So sisters, be willing to confidently see the glorious outcome of God's work through you. Prepare for the Jordan. Prepare by your heart and, by, and your soul by seeking him by knowing him, by meditating upon his instructions. Find him in the instructions. Plant him within your hearts. And then stand assured of his promises and the victorious outcome that is promised to us. Don't settle for less than what God is willing to give to you. I praise you with all of my love.